Hello everyone. Welcome back to Classical Archaeology. In this video, we're going to discuss the Roman civilization from its founding in about 753 BC to the end of the Roman Republic in about 27 BCE. So we're going to be discussing over 700 years of events. And in this video, we're going to compare the historical narrative of the Roman civilization uh, to the archaeological evidence that scholars have recovered. Also, we should discuss briefly the Roman takeover of Greece, which uh, occurred from about 200 to 146 BCE. This was occurring sort of simultaneously with uh, the Third Punic War. Um, the Romans had been encroaching and expanding into Greek territory for over half a century. The decisive battle was fought at Corinth in 146 BCE. Um, basically, by the late 140s, most of um, the Greek city-states south of Macedonia um, had been made into what was called a client state. Uh, remember, a client state is semi-independent, but is still obligated to obey Rome. And the Romans said to the Achaean League, now that you are our client state, you have freedom. The Greek city-states didn't understand what the Romans meant by freedom. They didn't really mean freedom. Remember, patrons always said, you are my friend, you are free, but they didn't actually mean it. They, they meant you have to obey me. And the Corinthians and the Achaean League took freedom literally, and they re rebelled against the, uh, the Romans. So they didn't understand Roman um, obligation culture, and that leads to the war in which they lose their independence completely. Um, Roman general uh, Lucius Mummius will lay waste to Carthage, not Carthage, Corinth. He will destroy uh, Corinth because Corinth was like the wealthiest, the wealthiest, most powerful city um, of the Greeks at this point in history. It was also the headquarters of the rebellion against Rome. The Corinthians were also enslaved their city was destroyed, but Corinthian Greeks were then spread across the Roman civilization as slaves, and they introduced even more elements of Greek culture to the Romans. Like Carthage, um, Corinth is going to be rebuilt uh, about 100 years later. And the Romans were admirers of, of Greek culture, uh, and they spread Greek art and architecture and language across their expanding territorial holdings, especially in the eastern parts of the Roman civilization. Uh, in the eastern parts of the Roman civilization, Greek is going to be a very commonly used language, just as much as Latin. Even though the Romans liked Greek culture, they had kind of what historians call a love-hate relationship with the Greeks. They generally thought that the Greeks were weaker and um, not as strong as they were. That They spent too much time on art and not enough time on preparing for war. Here is a bust of Lucius uh, Mummius. You can see from the bust, they're not trying to portray a, a beautiful man. They're trying to portray a very stern, um, uh, very uh, war-weary man as, as a general like, like Mummius would have been. Um, here we see a painting of the destruction of Corinth, uh, the population being um, sold as slaves. And of course, you can see evidence of the destruction of Corinth even now, although Corinth was going to be rebuilt by the Romans. Now that we've discussed the Roman takeover of the Greek mainland, and we discussed uh, the Punic Wars in the last video, I want to mention uh, some of the things that were going on uh, back in Rome itself uh, as these wars were taking place and then in the, the years after. And I specifically want to mention um, the Gracchus brothers, uh, the Gracchi. Uh, we'll start by talking about Tiberius Gracchus. He lived from 163 BCE to 133 BCE. He was a uh, veteran of the Third Punic War. He would have taken part in the, the Punic Wars of a very young man. And uh, when he returned to Rome, he got involved in politics. Specifically, he wanted to help uh, plebeians, poor Romans, um, and, and just poor Romans living in the countryside and in the urban centers. Um, in particular, he really wanted to help veterans of the war who had lost their land. A lot of uh, middle class and poorer Romans who'd served uh, Rome in the Punic Wars, they had, uh, their families had fallen into debt. 
while the uh, male uh, breadwinner was off fighting in the war, the father, the uh, husband, uh, the oldest son, um, he would be fighting in the war and the family might fall into debt and they might lose their land to uh, wealthier Romans or to uh, patricians uh, slash basically the, the patron class, you know, wealthier people. And patricians and wealthier people, they began building uh, large landed estates, what were called uh, latifundios. By the way, latifundia um, is still used in uh, Spanish to refer to large uh, land estates in like Latin America. So it's a Latin term that's still used by um, Romance language speaking uh, peoples. And uh, Tiberius had a mistrust for the older patrician class. Remember, patricians are wealthier people um, who can trace their lineage back to the founding families of Rome. And he saw their greed and their building of these large landed estates in the countryside as a threat to the patronage system. It was making uh, poorer people too poor um, so they couldn't take care of themselves. And the patricians themselves were not really taking care of the poor. They were making their clients poorer, but they weren't really helping their clients as patrons. And naturally, uh, the patricians and the wealthier Romans, they didn't really like Tiberius very much. And he ends up being killed by a mob of uh, men led by the Pontifex Maximus, or the high priest. And the mob that killed him were uh, people who opposed his policies. And he was killed in 133 uh, BCE. And the image on this slide is a bust that we believe is of Tiberius Gracchus. And this is a image of the uh, killing of Tiberius Gracchus. He was beaten to death by a mob led by the uh, high priest or Pontifex Maximus. Uh, the people who wanted him dead would have been wealthier men who saw uh, Tiberius uh, as a threat. Tiberius, he didn't like the fact that they were building large um, latifundio estates. He wanted to break up the lands um, and uh, return them to uh, poorer Romans. That way poorer Romans could be more uh, independent. We should also mention uh, Gaius Gracchus, uh, the brother of Tiberius, who lived a little bit later, 154 to 121 uh, BCE. And he served as a uh, tribune, a, uh, one of the few Roman politicians that could actually be elected by plebeians, uh, by everyday uh, Roman people. Roman people who were citizens, of course, Roman citizens. Um, and um, Gaius proposed a new political class for the Republic, uh, the Equites. Um, also known as the Equestrians or the Knights in English. Uh, traditionally, uh, Equites, uh, true to their name, were uh, cavalry. They uh, had horses. They gen generally were wealthier people, but they lived in rural areas on the Italian peninsula outside of Rome. And Gaius's idea was have the Equites become a new uh, political class um, and they would balance the power of the Senate. And uh, the equites would uh, serve on trials of senators. Uh, basically, the idea was um, the equites would oversee the trials of senators. Senators would frequently be put on trial for uh, fraud and other types of crimes. On the whole, jury trials are less common in the Roman civilization than they were in, say, Athens. But the idea was this would balance the power of the Senate. Um, and that was what Gaius wanted. And, um, Naturally, uh, the Senate was not a fan of Gaius, and Gaius and his supporters were eventually uh, driven out of Rome, and they were killed by a militia that was uh, loyal to the Senate in uh, the year 121 uh, BCE. Some accounts say that Gaius, in the face of, of being killed, chose to commit suicide instead, but either way, um, the Senate um, has uh, Gaius um, killed or pressures him into committing suicide. Either way, the, the Senate wanted Gaius Gracchus gone. They didn't like him just like they didn't like his brother Tiberius. And the image on this slide is a bust that's believed to be of uh, Gaius Gracchus. And here we see a um, late 18th century painting showing the uh, death of Gaius Gracchus. Uh, he's being pursued by a 
uh, militia or paramilitary that's loyal to the Senate. And uh, this is uh, Gaius in his final moments before he either is killed or commits suicide. Now we'll talk a little bit about the Gracchi brothers in uh, retrospect, the reforms they were proposing. These reforms were populist in nature. They were supposed to help the poor and they were supposed to limit the power of the wealthy. And their reforms and then their violent deaths, um, they're basically being killed by wealthier factions within Roman politics, will lead to the creation of what are called the populares and the optimates, or populars and optimates, depending on how you want to say it. And the populares, um, they advocated for the poor, uh, for the people, um, hence their name. Uh, populum is, is people in, in Latin. And the optimates, um, or optimates, they advocated for uh, the rule of the best, or aristocracy, for the best people to be in charge of uh, Roman society. They wanted to keep the senatorial class and uh, the elite of Rome in charge of the Republic. And I would say that uh, these two factions, the Populares and the Optimates, they're basically the closest thing that the Roman Republic will have to political parties. And scholars will debate the effects of the Gracchi reforms if they went too far or if their reforms were a necessary corrective to help the people. But they generally agree that the violence that um, leads to their death, you know, both men are, are, they meet violent ends. It's signaling the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. Romans are no longer um, finding peaceful solutions for dealing with political issues. They're beginning to turn more and more to violence. And you'll see some other uh, important social, political, and uh, military changes are going to only uh, lead to increased violence and then ultimately the dissolution of the Republic. Now I want to discuss uh, the Marian reforms, circa 107 BCE. And the Marian reforms are very important. Uh, I would argue they're even more important than the uh, failed uh, reforms of the uh, Gracchi brothers. Uh, to begin, Roman consul Gaius Marius instituted a series of military reforms in the early 100s BCE. These reforms were designed to help the Roman Republic defend its growing territorial holdings. Greece, North Africa, etc. Uh, Marius wanted to standardize the Roman infantry, um, basically creating uh, the legionaries that we associate with the late Republic and then with the Roman Empire. Um, Marius instituted the uh, cohort system. Um, this was different than the older maniple system. Uh, the cohort system was a lot more flexible and it would allow the uh, Romans to more easily break up their legions as needed in combat. So they could have a lot more small unit tactics. It was a lot more efficient, but then they could mass their forces when needed as well in battle. There's also um, an attempt to standardize Roman weapons and armor. Uh, rather than having uh, individual Roman soldiers provide whatever equipment and uh, weapons they could afford, now arms and equipment are going to be a lot more standardized. And because of the Roman reforms or the reforms of Marius, you're going to see uh, the iconic uh, Roman scutum shields, these um, the concave rectangular shields that we associate with the Roman military, um, the Gallia uh, style helmets. Um, we'll also see the Lorica segmentata, uh, iconic Roman breastplate. Um, along with other other types of Roman armor, like the Lorica squamata, uh, which was scale armor, and the Lorica hamata, which was basically chainmail. Things are going to get a lot more standardized. Eventually, things like the Lorica segmentata will uh, begin to replace the squamata and the hamata. Um, that's going to really, though, not be um, complete until like the mid first century CE. So. A lot of the Roman arms and equipment um, that we think of when we think of the Roman armies, the Roman legions, uh, it wouldn't have happened without uh, the Marian reforms. Um, and the reason Marius was standardizing everything is because Marius was transitioning the Roman military away from the part-time citizen soldier militias that had served uh, in previous wars, like the Punic Wars. 
Uh, instead, he's moving towards a standing professional army uh, of soldiers who will serve, depending on what period of Roman history you're looking at, between 16 and, uh, and about 20 years, sometimes longer. Uh, and this uh, system, in many ways, is actually very egalitarian. The new Roman legions will allow uh, poorer Romans, assuming they're male citizens and free, to serve in uh, the military. They um, will have their armor provided for them. They'll receive a salary. Uh, they won't have to worry about uh, their family uh, starving to death while they're gone. Actually, Roman Roman legionaries are not going to be allowed to really have uh, like wives and, and children, but they wouldn't have to worry about like their parents or their uh, sisters and brothers back at home. On the negative side, uh, however, um, the uh, new Roman soldiers, uh, while egalitarian, they gradually became uh, more loyal to their general and to the legion they served in rather than um, to Rome itself. Um, you know, previous Roman legions, they, they had property requirements. They had um, to be able to provide their own armor. It was generally more middle-class Roman citizens, you know, people who had uh, a stake in Roman politics, much more so than a poorer Roman citizen. Uh, and these poorer Roman citizens who became soldiers, uh, they recognized that their generals and the legion that they were in, um, that was what allowed them to make more money and things like that in the form of plunder, in the form of gold and silver, spoils of war. Uh, so they became more loyal uh, to their legion and to their generals than they were to the Republic. Um, another negative also is that the burden of equipping the military will now fall on the Roman state. This will incentivize uh, future wars as a way to bring wealth into the empire. So you're going to see more warfare, uh, really what you might call a Roman military industrial complex as the Romans need to go to war to be able to pay their soldiers. Another negative also is that in peacetime, Roman soldiers will have to be supported through taxation. And taxation is going to be a serious burden for Roman citizens. Uh, it's going to um, be very difficult for poor Romans who are already struggling to get by. Now they have to pay uh, taxes they wouldn't have had to pay before. Um, and wealthier Romans are also going to struggle with uh, these taxes because wealthier Romans are already having to pay to take care of their clients and now they have to pay additional taxes to Rome. But we'll talk more about taxation uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, what kind of taxes citizens had to pay, what kind of taxes non-citizens had to pay uh, in, in future videos. So um, these are the Marian reforms. They give us a standardized uh, professional Roman army. The equipment is standardized. Poor men can serve in the Roman army now. Property requirements are, are done away with. They receive their own gear. They receive uh, a salary. But these new Roman soldiers, uh, these new legionaries, they become more loyal to their generals and to their legions than they are to the uh, Roman Senate and the Roman state. And that's going to lead to the uh, violent civil wars you see uh, that will ultimately bring an end to the Roman Republic. Here is an example of how Roman helmets changed thanks to the uh, Marian reforms. On the right here is an older Monte Fortino helmet made of bronze. It's planar and, and, and simpler and provides less protection than the later Gallia helmet. Um, this Monte Fortino helmet is incomplete though. It would have had cheek plates that would have hung down from the side here. They've been lost. Um, this, of course, these cheek plates are flexible. They, they're in a hinge here, similar to the later Gallia helmet. The Gallia helmets, um, some were made of bronze, but over time they're, they're made of iron. Iron, of course, is stronger than bronze. Also, the, uh, the, the neck protection plate is much larger on a Gallia helmet, and there's better um, hearing, um, hearing protection as well. So you can see how the Marian reforms lead to a um, better military technology for the Romans. Here are some examples of Roman body armor. Um, on the left here, you can see uh, the remains of a Lorica segmentata with a reconstruction. This piece, I believe, is uh, from the 120s CE, uh, found in Britannia, or Britain. The Lorica Segmentata, the Romans probably began to introduce uh, the Lorica Segmentata around the 50s BCE, but 
I don't think it became very common until well into the first century CE. Remember, these, these Marian reforms of standardization, they actually take a kind of a long time to uh, really uh, get going. And I think it takes a while for the uh, Lorica segmentata to become standard. Uh, really, that's going to be much later in like the first century uh, CE. And this piece is actually from the uh, 120s uh, CE. So it's actually from the beginning of the second century. The Romans would have uh, phased out older styles of armor, um, like the uh, Lorca Hamada, uh, which is basically chainmail, and um, also they would have um, possibly phased out the uh, Lorca Squamata as well. Uh, this is scale armor. Uh, this example is actually from the 1st to 5th century CE. Um, auxiliaries, uh, that is, non-Roman citizens who fought uh, not in uh, the legions, but fought um, in other types of, of units, you know, auxiliary units, as they were called. They would have used um, squamata scale armor and hamada chain armor for uh, quite a while longer. So the Marian reforms, they do bring out increased standardization in the Roman military, but the standardization is not truly universal, and what standardization that does take place takes place pretty slowly over the course of really a couple hundred years. And here's the uh, Roman scutum shield. Um, the Romans liked oblong shields. Um, this shield, though, is much more rectangular, and it's also um, it's convex, meaning it points outward. Um, this convex design provides better protection, but also it allows them to form what's called the testudum or the tortoise uh, shield wall. It's a lot like a Greek phalanx, but much more protective. Also, the convex uh, shape on the upper layer of, of scutum shields allows the legionaries to see and to charge their enemies, but also to stick a uh, gladius sword out so they can not only see, but they can fend off their enemies as well when they're in the testudum uh, formation. Here are some modern reenactors wearing various types of uh, Roman armor. These, these, these reenactors here are pre-Marian based on uh, the helmets. Um, these are more like simpler Monte Fortino helmets, um, often decorated with feathers. Uh, they're using oval shaped shields and they're using these look like um, Lorica Hamada Chainmail. The, these um, legionaries are from much later, or they're impersonating later Roman soldiers who have Gallia helmets and Lorica Segmentata and uh, Scutum shields. Much better armor, but much more expensive. Of course, you can see the similarities between Roman armor and uh, modern armor. Uh, modern football pads, um, similar similar shape um, to Lorica segmentata and uh, riot police today um, use riot shields that are similar you know they have a con convex shape similar to uh, that of the Roman uh, scutum shield here's a structure of the Roman legion you can see the cohorts um, there were usually 10 cohorts uh, they were, of course, accompanied by cavalry and light troops. Light troops um, did not have the kind of armor, and usually we were not legionaries. They were what were called auxiliaries. We'll talk about auxiliaries in the next video. Um, the sentry, of course, uh, included usually more like 80 soldiers. The sentry means 100 in Latin, but there were usually 80 soldiers and perhaps 20 um, support personnel, which would have included um, cooks, physicians, uh, servants and slaves uh, who provided labor and, and uh, logistical assistance to the actual soldiers. And you can see how the cohorts would have fit into the larger, larger legion. And the legions typically had about 5,000 troops. And there was a lot of legion pride. Sometimes the uh, legion had uh, different colors they wore. Legions had their own um, symbols. They also had the Roman eagle. To um, lose the Roman eagle was a great disgrace and dishonor on a legion. Um, you did not want to have uh, that kind of defeat. With this discussion of the Marian reforms 
the creation of a Roman uh, standing army, uh, increased standardization of Roman arms and equipment. We should mention uh, the Social War of 91 to 88 BCE. And this war was fought between the Roman Republic and their allies or um, uh, allies or uh, soci. And uh, basically, uh, Rome had control of the Italian peninsula by the 200s BCE, but not all of the people living uh, on the Italian peninsula were considered to be Roman citizens. Some of them were basically allies of Rome or clients of Rome. And um, there were rebellions by other people on the Italian peninsula, namely the Samnites and the Marsi. You can, ex you can see an example of Samnite soldiers uh, on the, the left side of the, this slide. And in this conflict, the uh, Roman Republic will use legions that are being transformed by the Marian reforms. And in the end, the Romans are victorious. They defeat the uh, Samnite and Marci rebellion. Um, and as a result of winning the war, they decide to give all Italian people, that is all people living on the Italian uh, peninsula, Roman citizenship. So out of this war, um, all Italian people, that is all free Italian people, slaves are not included, they are given Roman citizenship. Uh, and so henceforth, all uh, Italians are going to be referred to as Romans. And really, the, the social war, it leads to the last vestiges of uh, non-Roman Italian, Ita Italic cultures uh, being dissolved. So on the one hand, these people are gaining Roman citizenship, which is good. On the other hand, there's going to be increased pressure for them to give up their own native culture and adopt Roman culture. We saw the Romans do this with the Etruscans, and they're going to do it with uh, people like the Samnites as well. And uh, the social war, it shows uh, the Romans' power, not only their power in warfare, but their power to acculturate and assimilate other cultures as well, and to make them Roman. And again, the image on this slide is of Samnite soldiers. It's a fresco from a, a tomb at a site called Nola. This, this fresco is actually from uh, the 4th century BCE, uh, but it gives you an idea of what uh, Samnites might have looked like, even if it is a few hundred years before the Social War. And this is a map of uh, Roman Italy um, shortly before the uh, Social War uh, took place. The image on the uh, right-hand side uh, shows uh, some scenes from the Social War. You can see um, the Romans uh, here fighting uh, the Samnites. Uh, the, the soldiers in this uh, image, their uh, tunics and their shields have been copied uh, from the tunics and shields uh, seen on the fresco tomb in the previous slide. And you can see, however, on the map that there are uh, basically colonies of ethnic Romans throughout the Italian peninsula. And then you'll also see that there are um, basically the ally states um, who are living on the Italian peninsula, who are allied with Rome and are clients of Rome, but they're not fully Roman. Um, in the social war, these allies will be defeated and they will be made Roman. They'll gain Roman citizenship, but it will come at the expense of, of their culture being uh, dissolved and being assimilated into the Roman culture. Now I want to talk about the first of three periods of civil war in uh, the Roman Republic. And these three periods of civil war will lead to uh, the dissolution of the Roman Republic. The first war um, is a series of conflicts between um, Consul Marius of the Marian reforms and a general named Sulla. And these uh, wars take place from 88 to 87, and then again from 83 to 81 uh, BCE. And the cause of, of Sulla's wars uh, with the Republic was the fact that uh, Consul Marius uh, recalled Sulla from his fight against um, Mithridates of Pontus in Anatolia, 
um, depriving Sulla and his troops of the spoils of war. Uh, it would seem that Marius was getting very concerned about the military glory that Sulla was gaining uh, while fighting in Anatolia, and he recalled uh, Sulla so that he could take control of his legions. In response, uh, Sulla and his legions will march on Rome. They will defeat uh, Marius's forces, and they will uh, take control of the Republic. And um, at this point, uh, there had not been a dictator for, o over the Roman Republic for over a century, not since the Second Punic War. Uh, remember, during the Second Punic War, the Italian uh, heartland, the heartland of the Roman Republic, was invaded by Hannibal and the Carthaginians. Um, as dictator, uh, Sulla was uh, not a good leader. Not like uh, Camillus and Cincinnatus, the good dictators before him, who only uh, thought about fighting against Rome's enemies. Uh, Sulla uh, focused his efforts on killing and exiling political opponents, including people like Julius Caesar. Uh, Caesar managed to survive uh, Sulla's purges. And Sulla was able to rule as dictator because he uh, strengthened the patrician class um, and they supported his dictatorship. Uh, basically, if uh, Sulla was a part of a Roman political faction, he would have been part of the optimates, uh, the aristocratic faction. And Sulla will resign his dictatorship in about the year 79 BCE. He will leave public life and then die a year later. Uh, Sulla's coup would inspire uh, Julius Caesar's uh, takeover of Rome as well. Um, and uh, the images on this slide are Roman denarii or silver coins from the period. The top features the profile of Sulla. And on the bottom, we see uh, Sulla on one side of the coin. And on the other side of the coin, we see the profile of the goddess Diana or Artemis as she was known to the Greeks. Here are a couple more important facts about Sulla, or Marcus Cornelius Sulla, his full name. He lived from 138 to 78 BCE, and he is the first Roman general to take control of Rome by force in over 400 years. Although Rome had been at war with other civilizations, whether it was the Carthaginians or um, the Allies during the Social War, there hadn't been as much internal turmoil within uh, the Roman Republic, uh, at least not until this point. And uh, Sulla will, of course, take control of Rome twice, from 88 to 87, and then again uh, in uh, 83 uh, BCE. And the first time uh, that he took control of Rome, it was because Consul Marius had recalled Sulla from his war against uh, Mithridates of Pontus over in uh, Anatolia. And after taking over Rome, uh, making uh, Marius flee, uh, Sulla will again uh, return to Asia Minor. Marius will retake Rome, and then uh, Marius will die, and Sulla will return um, to Rome again, and he will make himself uh, dictator. And as I said before, uh, Sulla was a very brutal dictator. Um, uh, he will lead a reign of terror against his political opponents, which involved uh, proscription, uh, proscription was uh, basically a Roman uh, law where people would be made outlaws, and then anyone who killed the proscribed outlawed people, uh, they would not face any penalties for killing these people, and they could take uh, the property of the people they had killed. And again, uh, Sulla was able to rule as dictator because he had support from the patrician class, the upper class, uh, Roman people supported him. He definitely was on the optimates side of Roman politics. And Sulla will uh, give up power peacefully in 79 BC and then will retire from public life. And one of Sulla's most important supporters was a young man by the name of uh, Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey as he's uh, better known. And the image on this slide is a bust that is thought to be of Sulla. Uh, this is uh, an Augustan copy of an original older uh, bust. Uh, it may or may not be of Sulla, but when people think of Sulla, they generally think of this bust, so I've included it.
This is Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, better known as Pompey. He lived from 106 to 48 BCE, and he rose to prominence uh, while serving uh, as a military commander for Sulla. Uh, Pompey came from a very wealthy family, and he raised a private army using his family's riches to support Sulla. And, um, and he helped Sulla create a system uh, that really was not rule of the best and not a system of obligation, but uh, what some historians and scholars call violence and power politics. Basically, that um, whoever is the most powerful, they're going to rule Rome, not necessarily patrons looking after uh, clients and everyone trying to help each other the way things had been before. Systems of obligation are breaking down and becoming a lot more violent. And examples of this kind of violence is uh, like the Catiline or Catiline conspiracy of 63 uh, BCE, where Romans are trying to seize control of their government uh, using force and using violence because they've seen other people do it successfully. They've seen Sulla do it. And uh, Julius Caesar will see that people did it before him, and so he'll do it. And Pompey uh, will rule as a consul with uh, Marcus Crassus and then Julius Caesar in what was called a triumvirate or rule of three. And Pompey was a successful military commander. He won fame and plunder during the third war against uh, Mithridates in Pontus. And he also captured uh, territory in north central Africa and uh, Jerusalem. Basically, Pompey brought an end to the Seleucid Empire, and he also brought the Israelite Hasmonean Kingdom into the, uh, the Roman Republic. After the death of Crassus, he became uh, the sole consul in 52 BCE, alarming Julius uh, Caesar, and this will inspire uh, Julius Caesar at the time who was outside of Rome to then march on Rome uh, in 49 BCE. And ultimately, Pompey will be defeated by uh, Julius Caesar at the, the Battle of Pharsalus in Greece in 48 BCE. Pompey would then retreat to Egypt, where he would be uh, assassinated by troops loyal to uh, Egyptian Hellenistic King Ptolemy XIII, um, technically an ally of his. Um, And Ptolemy the Thirteenth was um, the brother of Queen Cleopatra the Seventh, and Cleopatra was an ally of Julius Caesar. Uh, so, in some ways, by being the enemy of Cleopatra, uh, Ptolemy was sort of an ally of Pompey. So, it makes his decision to have uh, Pompey assassinated all the more uh, troubling. And Julius Caesar certainly was very troubled. Um, to see that Pompey was assassinated by, by Ptolemy. Even though Pompey was his enemy, he felt that it was dishonorable for Pompey to have been uh, killed by Ptolemy. And this is a very famous bust of Pompey. Uh, it can be found at the uh, Met New York City if you want to see it in person. So now we'll talk about uh, Julius Caesar and his rise to power and the beginning of the second uh, period of uh, civil wars in the Roman Republic. Uh, Caesar's full name was Gaius uh, Julius Caesar. He lived from 100 to 44 BCE. Uh, Caesar was from a patrician family. Initially, he was a priest. It seems he wanted to pursue a religious, uh, religious life, uh, but uh, he's forced to give up his position as a priest due to uh, the persecution and proscriptions of Sulla. Um, while traveling in the Eastern Mediterranean, he's going to be kidnapped by pirates uh, while he was on a diplomatic mission. And um, it's said that uh, the pirates kidnapped Caesar and they said that they were going to hold him as a hostage. Um, and Caesar said, well, whatever uh, ransom money you were gonna ask for, double it because that's how important I am. Pirates thought that he was very arrogant and haughty for saying such a thing. In the end, uh, Caesar will be freed from the pirates, and then he will go after the pirates and have them uh, crucified.
crucified. So Caesar got his revenge on the, the pirates that kidnapped him. In 58 BCE, uh, to improve his financial position, uh, Caesar would take uh, his four legions to Gaul to fight uh, various uh, Celtic peoples um, that were uh, moving around in, in that region. Um, and some of them wanted to enter Roman territory, uh, and uh, Caesar would not permit them to do that. Or he considered allowing them to enter Roman territory, but then changed his mind. Or he always planned to uh, attack these people in order to provoke a war between um, his legions and the Celts. Either way, though, Caesar used these wars in Gaul to improve his uh, finances um, and to improve his political standing. Caesar had been involved in uh, Roman politics. Um, he was a consul along with Marcus Crassus and uh, Pompey. Um, Pompey was on Sulla's side in uh, the previous uh, period of civil war, and Crassus was kind of a balancing factor, kind of keeping these two former enemies together as, as allies. But being a politician uh, in, in Rome was very expensive because you had to provide food and wine and entertainment for your clients, and it would put Caesar into a great deal of debt. So going to war, not only would it have allowed Caesar to distinguish himself as an imperator, as a successful general, it would have allowed him to uh, bring in uh, money and to pay off his debts. So there are many reasons why he wanted to go to war in, uh, in Gaul, even if uh, how the war specifically started is a bit, a bit hazy and perhaps even a, a bit unethical uh, on the part of, of, of Caesar. But we'll talk about the ethics of, of uh, the Gallic War uh, later on. So by 55 BCE, uh, Caesar is um, invading um, Celtic territory in Gaul in what is now uh, France, and he will gradually take over um, the region, bringing Gaul into the uh, Roman Republic. Uh, Caesar will also invade Britain, but he's going to fail to conquer the Celtic people in the, the British Isles. And now these Celtic uh, people are broken up into tribes, uh, various tribes, uh, some are Caesar's enemy, some will actually try to ally with, with Caesar. It was actually kind of at the bidding of a, uh, a Celtic uh, tribal leader that he will invade uh, Britannia, the British Isles, in the first place. But the harsh weather of the British Isles, rain, uh, unfavorable rain, winds, and things like that will make it very difficult for Caesar to conduct uh, military operations in, in Gaul. I mean, Britannia. And some might think, well, did Caesar even really go to Britannia, or did he just make up this story to make himself sound uh, like a better um, general than he actually was? Well, there is archaeological evidence that uh, Caesar was, in fact, in Britannia. Uh, by 52 um, BCE, uh, most of the Celts have been brought under Roman control, but some of these disparate Celtic tribes will try to unite so that they can rebel against Caesar in Rome. And they will be led by a uh, Celtic chieftain named Vercingetorix, but it was, it was too little too late. Even though uh, Vercingetorix's forces will actually outnumber uh, Caesar's, they're just not organized enough to uh, defeat Caesar and the Romans. And in the end, uh, Vercingetorix is forced to surrender to Caesar, and Celtic resistance in Gaul is uh, going to be uh, crushed. In 49 BCE, uh, Caesar will cross the Rubicon River, invading uh, the Italian peninsula. This was a treasonous offense, meaning that if Caesar were to be defeated and captured, he would uh, certainly be executed for, for treason. And this will, of course, uh, kick off the Second uh, Roman Civil War, in which Caesar will fight Pompey and then will become a dictator. Pompey and the Senate will flee uh, Rome. Um, Caesar will enter Rome, become a dictator in uh, 48 BCE, and he will defeat um, Pompey shortly thereafter. And Pompey, though, will be assassinated, as I mentioned, by uh, Ptolemy the 13th of Egypt. This is the Sabura district, where Caesar grew up. Um, it's basically a slum. When Caesar is living there, it has very drab brick buildings. 
it's not a nice place to live. It's not a place that patricians live. Um, you can see that there's a mixture of, of Roman and then later um, medieval architecture at, at Sabura. It's not been uh, preserved as it was during Roman times. This, of course, is the biggest challenge of urban archaeology. Continuously um, inhabited sites have layers and layers of human activity of really valuable artifacts from many different eras. And to try to investigate one period, you often have to destroy other, other artifacts and other periods. Heinrich Schleiman, of course, did that when he was investigating Troy. Um, nowadays, archaeologists are much more careful, but uh, it's why archaeology in a place like Rome can actually be very challenging, because a place like Sabura, um, there's multiple layers of inhabitation. This is a map of uh, Caesar's campaign in Gaul. It shows um, his, his brief invasion of Britannia, or um, England as we call it today. Um, you can see that he's all over all over what is now France and also parts of Netherlands and um, even parts of Germany as well, defeating the various Celtic peoples. Um, one of the reasons the Celts were moving into Roman territory is because of the Germanic people. The Germanic people were basically pushing the Celts westward into Roman territory. Here is a diagram uh, explaining the siege of Alicia the uh, last battle of Caesar's Gallic War. Um, Julius Caesar trapped uh, Vercingetorix and his uh, army, along with their, their, um, their civilian force, women and children, at Alesia. Caesar uh, fortified his uh, camp around um, the, the, the city or the town of Alesia. And then um, the, the Celts surround Caesar. So the besieger, Caesar, becomes the besieged. But in the end, uh, Caesar is able to outlast the Celts. Um, there's reports that Vercingetorix um, pushed all of his women and children and civilians out of Alesia so that the Romans would have to take care of them and feed them. And Caesar just chose to let the civilians uh, starve to death rather than weaken his own army. Also, Roman cavalry reinforcements arrived and they defeated the, uh, the Gauls that were trying to break into Caesar's defenses from the outside evidence of some structures um, around Alesia. These are um, you know, a mixture of Roman and Celtic structures uh, at this battlefield. And this battlefield, by the way, is in, in the north of France. Here are reconstructions um, of what we think Caesar's fortifications would have looked like. They would have included these uh, wooden towers in the uh, background and walls. And then in the foreground, there would have been a series of uh, moats that would have uh, prevented an assault by uh, the, the Gauls. Of course, he also put these sticks into, into the ground that would impale uh, people who were charging his position. The siege itself was fought in September of 52 BCE, so late summer, early fall. Uh, with the winter coming, that would have added uh, a sense of urgency to both sides. Um, the Romans were, were a much, much smaller force, um, surrounded by over 250 Celts outside of their fortification. The, uh, the Celts outside of the fortification were not unified enough to break through uh, Caesar's defenses, and they were routed by uh, Roman cavalry reinforcements. In the end, Vercingetorix uh, surrenders, and eventually he's executed in Rome in 46 uh, BCE uh, to glorify uh, Julius Caesar. And of course, the conquest of Gaul was solidified by the siege of Alesia, and Caesar's victories and the wealth he brings into the Republic allowed him to uh, eventually take control of the Roman Republic as a dictator. This is the remains of a foundation of a Roman military barracks in uh, Southeast England. It's believed to have been built during the time of Julius Caesar, highlighting that Julius Caesar did in fact uh, invade Britain, although he did fail to conquer it. It wouldn't be fully um, conquered or until the reign of Emperor Claudius. And even then, the Romans do not conquer the entirety of the island of Great Britain, only part of it. Here is an artist's representation of Julius Caesar uh, meeting with Vercingetorix, who is trying to surrender. Um, you see that Julius Caesar is wearing a uh, Roman toga. It's a reddish purple color. 
Uh, Julius Caesar liked to wear uh, purple togas. Purple was a color of wealth and opulence. In Rome, it was made from uh, the dye of, of made from seashells, uh, from a mollusk, actually initially discovered by the Phoenicians. It will become uh, purple, which red will become a symbol of um, the emperors after Julius Caesar. Caesar himself was not a, uh, an emperor. He was a dictator, but later Roman emperors will copy uh, Julius Caesar's style. Here is a map of the Roman Empire at its greatest extent. You can see the territories that the uh, Romans brought in during the Republic period. You can see uh, Caesar's Gaul as well. Uh, and then you can see uh, territories that were brought in later during the Imperial period, which will be the subject of uh, the next video. Here's a modern um, painting of Julius Caesar uh, crossing the Rubicon. Um, into Rome. This is a, definitely a more negative portrayal of Caesar. We see uh, death and destruction in his uh, behind him, skulls and bones, people crying out and, and hiding, and we see uh, the earth, um, and we see that Caesar's ambition um, is, is leading him to conquer uh, Rome. Ambition was something that uh, the Romans did not like, uh, ambition has a very positive connotation to us today, but to the Romans, ambition was an unhealthy desire for power and glory. And the artist uh, in this painting is trying to uh, capture how, how the Romans would have viewed the ambition of Caesar. Keep in mind that uh, many, many poor Romans loved Julius Caesar and thought of him as a hero, whereas wealthier Romans were uh, threatened by his ambition because his ambition came at the expense of their power. This is the Appian Way. It's a road in uh, southern and central Italy. Uh, it connects Rome with uh, cities to the south. Caesar and his troops would have used roads like the Appian Way as they were marching uh, toward Rome. And then as they're marching to other parts of the Italian peninsula, consolidating their, their hold over uh, uh, Italia and uh, Rome. One of the reasons that uh, the people supported Julius Caesar was not just his populist policies, his public works projects, but when he was taking over uh, the Italian peninsula, he and his troops were actually very disciplined. They didn't um, attack civilians uh, indiscriminately, as had been done during earlier conflicts like the Social War. Um, they didn't proscribe uh, Caesar's enemies, uh, ordering that they be uh, killed and their property given to the killers. So a lot of uh, Romans, especially poorer Romans, saw Julius Caesar as a much uh, less violent alternative than um, you know other other rulers. And of course, they supported his policies as well. But as you can see from uh, this this road, the Appian Way, uh, the Romans are very skilled road builders. They built these roads to connect their various provinces. These were major arteries of trade. Uh, armies would move down them um, on their way to the frontier or during these uh, civil wars. In fact, uh, armies often built roads themselves. So roads are very important in, in the Roman Republic and they're going to be very important in the uh, empire as well. This is a battle map showing the Battle of Pharsalus. It was fought 9th of August, 48 BCE in uh, Northwest Greece. And in this battle, uh, Caesar's much smaller force defeated Pompey's uh, much, much greater army. Um, Caesar had about 23,000 troops, whereas Pompey had about 45,000. And um, Pompey made a cavalry charge on uh, Caesar's uh, infantry. Um, his, Caesar's troops would have been more experienced with combat than uh, Pompey's would have. They withstood uh, the cavalry charge from Pompey, and then they led a fierce counterattack in which they broke uh, Pompey's army and then forced Pompey to retreat. And this was the decisive uh, battle um, of Pompey's war with Caesar, or Caesar's war with Pompey. Pompey is defeated. He will flee uh, the battlefield, and eventually he will be uh, killed by Ptolemy the Thirteenth. Now we'll discuss Julius Caesar as dictator and some of the things he did. Um, he ruled with his second in command, um, Mark Antony. 
his title was master of horse as second in command. Uh, he probably actually didn't take care of Caesar's horse, but that was just how they referred to uh, his second in command. It's a military term. Uh, Caesar refused to wear a crown because he did not want to be seen as a king. Uh, he knew that Roman society, especially the elite classes, hated kings. Anything that made him seem like a king, he didn't want to do. Instead, he wore um, crowns of, of uh, a golden crown of olive leaves, which was to symbolize victory. Uh, unlike Sulla, who really tried to um, ingratiate himself to the upper classes of Rome, uh, Caesar tried to be a man of the people. And this is probably because he lived in relative poverty as a child, and he was forced to flee from his life uh, during Sulla's reign of terror. He identified with um, poor people in a way that Sulla could not, and he probably identified with poor people in a way that the average wealthy Roman senator could not. So a lot of people really in the lower classes and the plebeian classes liked Julius Caesar and supported his dictatorship. Caesar also gained support of the people by building expensive public works projects, which would have impressed the plebeians. He needed their support to stay in power. Um, some good things that Caesar did in addition to his public works project was he uh, allowed um, or set up a path that non-Romans in Gaul could become citizens, those that hadn't been killed or enslaved. But becoming a citizen was uh, difficult. Um, it, it's, an, it's a difficult process. Um, to weaken the power of the old patrician Senate, he actually increased the Senate from 600 to 900. Um, you might say that he packed the Senate um, with supporters. Caesar, um, he was part of a political faction called the Populares. They, these were uh, people in the Roman government that claimed to be for the people versus another faction called the Optimates or Optimates who claimed to be for the upper classes. They were kind of like political parties, but not as organized as modern political parties were. You know, remember, remember, Caesar was from a patrician family. He was from a family that had nobility, but had fallen on hard times. And also Caesar lived in some pretty rough circumstances as a young man because he was hiding out from Sulla. So it was natural that he would support um, the populares and be a man of the people. But even after, as a dictator, he still acted as a general. Um, he's famous to have said, um, Vene, Vide, Vice, I came, I saw, I conquered after defeating uh, Pontus in Asia Minor. So he was a civil leader and a military leader as dictator. And he cast himself as a man of the people and he was loved by the people. Although a lot of old, more powerful uh, senators and patricians did not like Julius Caesar, seeing him as a threat to their own power. This is what's left of the Basilica Julia, um, which was built in about 46 BCE. Um, this was one of the buildings that, that Caesar built to um, gain the support of the everyday Romans. He also um, did a lot of renovations on the, on the, uh, the forum complex. Once again, it's so difficult um, to do urban archaeology, and especially like a, a place like Rome, because these buildings are constantly being changed, they're being renovated, they're being demolished and replaced. Sometimes buildings are burnt by fire, which we'll talk about in the next video. But the Basilica Julia was one of the buildings that Caesar built to get the support of everyday people. And the renovations that uh, Caesar made are called the Forum Iulum for um, Caesar or for Julius. Um, and these also would have helped him get support from everyday people. This is what the Forum Iulum might have looked like um, at the time of, of Julius Caesar after his renovations. Here's the theater of Marcellus, um, which was begun by Julius Caesar, but finished by Octavian. Octavian was um, a relative of, of Julius Caesar, but eventually became Julius Caesar's adopted son. And Octavian would become uh, the first Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. Theater's entertainment, of course, were important parts of Roman culture and entertainment provided by wealthy, powerful people in the government to the regular people that's part of the patronage obligation system. So now we'll discuss the assassination of Julius Caesar. Um, on 15th of March, the Ides of March, 44 BCE, uh, the senators um, led by Marcus Brutus and Cassius stabbed Caesar to death in the Senate. Um, the senators uh, claimed uh, that they killed Caesar 
because he had become too ambitious and also because Caesar had announced that he was going to be dictator for life. He was not going to um, resign from power at any point. He was going to only leave power in, in death. Um, everyday Romans were angered at Caesar's assassination. They, they liked Julius Caesar. They thought he was one of them, a man of the people, even though he was a dictator with absolute power. Everyday Romans uh, supported um, um, Caesar's protege and cousin, Mark Antony. Um, and Mark Antony will create the third triumvirate with Lepidus and Octavian, Caesar's uh, grandnephew, Octavian, who becomes Augustus Caesar. Uh, Julius Caesar was declared a god on 42 BCE, which would lead to the later tradition of Roman emperors being declared gods. The second triumvirate, Antony, Octavian, Lepidus, um, will go to war against Brutus and Cassius and would defeat them uh, actually in, in Greece at the Battle of Philippi. Also, um, Lepidus is eventually going to be kicked out of the triumvirate. Um, so it's not going to be three people. It's going to eventually just be Octavian and Antony. But even Octavian and Ant Antony are going to feud amongst each other, which will lead to the third and final uh, Republican Civil War. This is the Plaza Argentina, said to be the place where Caesar was assassinated. This is uh, what's believed to be the remains of Caesar's funeral pyre, where um, Caesar's body was burned after his death, along with uh, furniture and gifts from everyday Romans. Remember, the, the Romans generally preferred cremation as their uh, way of, of, of um, dealing with the dead. And, C and Antony gave a oration um, about um, Julius Caesar, what a good leader he was, he calls for the Roman people to support him and his triumvirate against the traitors Brutus and Cassius. This is another moment in Western history that's been duplicated and copied throughout Western um, literature and um, art, poetry, theater, uh, etc. And obviously the pyre of Caesar uh, is still a site that people visit nowadays and even place flowers on. I also want to mention uh, Marcus Tullius Cicero a Roman orator and statesman who was involved in uh, politics during the final years of the Roman Republic. Cicero was a uh, politician and statesman. He was the leader of the Optimates party. He was definitely on the elite side of Roman politics. And he had supported uh, Pompey uh, during the second period of Roman civil war seeing him as a preferable alternative to the more populistic Julius Caesar. And uh, in terms of his personal beliefs, Cicero was a believer in uh, Stoic philosophy. Stoic philosophy was a older Greek philosophy uh, that taught the importance of uh, having grace and having dignity during pain. Um, and uh, Cicero was a big believer in the idea of natural law and that um, what you saw in nature was right and moral. And he believed in the idea of humanitas as well and, and having humanity. Uh, and his Stoic philosophy um, in, reinforced his ideas of natural law and uh, humanitas. And Cicero was famous, uh, renowned for his rhetorical skills. His uh, speeches, his speaking and writing style, and his letters, they were imitated by Romans and then many other later Western authors and politicians. They will read uh, Cicero's speeches and his letters, and they will try to imitate his style. Um, Cicero, as an optimate, he was an enemy of uh, Octavian, Lepidus, and Mark Antony. Um, he criticized, in particular, Mark Antony uh, in a series of very harsh, very invective-laden speeches called Philippics. And Philippics were actually uh, a Greek style of speech in which uh, the speaker would denounce uh, an enemy politician. Uh, they were developed by uh, a Greek um, orator named Demosthenes from Athens. You probably remember Demosthenes spoke out against Philip of Macedon. That's why these speeches where you criticize a politician are called Philippics. In particular, um, 
his second Philip pick against Mark Anthony is, is the most famous and a very interesting speech. He accuses Mark Anthony of all sorts of things. He says that Mark Anthony is a big, uh, burly, handsome man, but he can't hold his liquor. Uh, he gets drunk and throws up all over the place. He says that uh, Mark Anthony has loose morals. He says that uh, Mark Anthony has sexual relationships with other men. Um, sexual relations between men took place in uh, the Roman civilization, but like the Greeks before them, the Romans had very strict rules about how those same-sex relationships took place. And according to Cicero, Antony broke all those rules, and he basically tries to defame Antony and make him look really bad in his Philippic speeches. And Antony is very angry and never really forgives Cicero for this. Um, and Cicero is considered to be uh, one of the uh, best Latin language orators of, of all time. As I said, his style has been mimicked by later Romans and many other world leaders, but his uh, speaking style was not enough to save him, and he ends up being um, killed by Antony's troops after he was first proscribed. And the image on this slide is a bust of Cicero. It's from the first century CE. Uh, it's in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. And as you can see, it's carved in that late Republican style. Cicero is shown with a receding hairline, a heavy, heavy brow, uh, wrinkles around his eyes and on his cheeks. He's shown with a double chin. It's very much that uh, portrait style that shows wealthy Romans as being old and tired and haggard, uh, possibly as a reference to how tired they were that the uh, Roman Republic was coming to an end. And of course, a bust like this would have been painted as well um, when it was made. This slide shows the uh, death of Cicero. It's said to have taken place December 7th, 43 BCE. Cicero uh, tried to escape uh, the Italian peninsula. He was hoping to get to Macedonia and um, his slaves were helping him escape by carrying him, him on a, uh, a litter uh, like this that you can see in uh, the, the slide image. Uh, Anthony's troops caught up to um, Cicero and it was reported that Cicero um, was brave in the face of death. He said, well, if you're going to kill me, at least make sure you cut off my head properly. And with that, um, Cicero, the great uh, Roman orator, met his fate at the hands of uh, Mark Antony's troops. His speaking style, his oratory style, while very brilliant, uh, made him a lot of enemies and ultimately, I would argue, led to his death. This is a uh, shot of the interior of Cicero's villa at uh, Formianum. It's outside of Rome. This was where he was living in his final days. And while it uh, may not look like much now, uh, it would have been very, very nice when uh, Cicero would have lived there. It had palatial gardens, it had fountains, it would have had uh, baths and uh, all sorts of uh, creature comforts for a man of Cicero's uh, political stature. And you can see the uh, Doric style columns that are uh, being used in this, um, in this building. You can see the uh, coffers in the uh, arched ceiling. So you can see the remnants of what would have been a uh, very beautiful uh, villa that Cicero spent his last days in before he was killed. This is a uh, building that was said to be the tomb of Cicero. It's a uh, stone tower built uh, in a cemetery complex outside of Formia. Like the Greeks, uh, the Romans typically built their tombs away from settlements uh, and from cities. They thought that um, the dead would make the world of the living uh, impure and that uh, the dead need to be buried away from where the living uh, were living and working and, and you know living their lives. Um, this structure is built near other mausoleums, and it's built along the Appian Way so that uh, Romans, as they were passing by, they would see this, this, this building, this tomb. So even though the Romans wanted to keep the dead away from their settlements and cities, they still wanted people to be able to see uh, their tombs as they passed uh, along the road. There is, however, some disagreement as to whether this building 
was actually a tomb for Cicero or if it was just a, uh, a cenotaph, basically a monument built to Cicero, but his body or his uh, ashes uh, were buried someplace else. Uh, there, there's debate about that. Uh, this site was basically forgotten about and it was used as a stable and a garden in the past, but it gained uh, renewed public interest in the 1930s under uh, the rule of uh, Benito uh, Mussolini. And Mussolini and his um, uh, Italian fascist government, they were very interested in um, excavating and rediscovering uh, Roman uh, archeology span and Roman sites as a way of legitimizing uh, their, their rule in, in Italy. Now that we've talked about the second triumvirate and the death of Cicero, we should talk about the uh, Battle of Philippi and the defeat of Brutus and Cassius, or the liberators as they call themselves. And this battle, of course, is fought at uh, Philippi in Macedonia slash northern Greece. Uh, the second triumvirate had about 108,000 troops and the Liberators had about 105,000 troops. This was one of the largest battles in the uh, Roman Civil Wars in which over 200,000 troops were engaged. A very large battle uh, divided between uh, 19 legions for the Second Triumvirate and 17 legions for the Liberators. And uh, the battles took place uh, on the 3rd of October and then again on the 23rd of October, uh, 42 uh, BCE. And it's a very messy series of battles with all four of the uh, generals will make some pretty serious uh, tactical uh, errors. Uh, and there's a lot of very uh, brutal hand-to-hand, um, -hand, uh, close quarters battling uh, and maneuvering uh, during these battles. In these battles, uh, Antony primarily fought Cassius and Octavian primarily fought Brutus. But uh, Cassius will commit suicide after a false report of Brutus's defeat. And this is not a good thing for the Liberator faction. They were actually, in the beginning of the battle, they had the upper hand. But the death of Cassius, who was a more experienced tactician than the younger Brutus, uh, will lead to a defeat for the Liberator's faction as um, Octavian and Antony will turn both of their attention towards defeating uh, Brutus. And um, eventually um, the uh, battle will be won by the second triumvirate. Um, Brutus will uh, commit suicide and the rest of Brutus's legions will surrender and be integrated into the uh, victorious triumvirs armies. And uh, the historian um, Plutarch actually wrote that um, Brutus was said to have had a vision uh, of his ghost shortly before his death, um, that he uh, was going to die and be defeated. And uh, this, this scene with Brutus and his ghost is referenced in uh, William Shakespeare's play, uh, Julius Caesar, about the, um, the life and death of Julius Caesar and uh, the uh, death of Brutus. This is a battle map of the battles uh, at Philippi. As you can see, Octavian and Brutus are primarily fighting each other, and Antony and Cassius are primarily fighting each other. And Antony will try to uh, outflank uh, Cassius, uh, moving in and around some marshes, but Cassius's camp will be uh, too well fortified, and he won't be able to uh, take Cassius's camp. As I said early on in uh, these battles, um, the Liberator faction, that is Brutus and Cassius, have the upper hand, but um, Cassius's untimely suicide will um, be the beginning of the end for the Liberator faction in these battles. And eventually, both Antony and Octavian will turn their attention towards defeating Brutus, who will also commit suicide. And these are some modern scenes from the Battle of Philippi. Uh, it's a very messy, very confused uh, set of engagements in the Battle of Philippi, or these two engagements uh, on the 3rd and 23rd of October. Um, the uh, various forces will assault each other's camps. Um, the Romans built fortified camps, um, as you saw in uh, Caesar's war in Gaul, and they will do this uh, well into the imperial period. 
and uh, Brutus was uh, said to see a vision of his ghost foretelling um, his defeat and his death. And in the end, uh, Brutus will uh, be defeated and he will commit suicide and the liberators will be defeated by the second triumvirate. This is a map of the Roman Republic. It shows uh, the territory that was under the control of Triumvir Octavian in purple. Uh, you see in this uh, orange color, Italia is uh, controlled by the Senate. And then uh, the areas in green are controlled by uh, Mark Antony. So Octavian is in the west, Antony is in the east, uh, in Greece, and he's very close to Egypt, although Egypt at this point is not part of the uh, Roman Republic. Uh, it's an ally of uh, Mark Antony via Cleopatra, his lover. And you can also see the territory controlled by Lepidus, Lepidus was uh, very much the uh, junior or weakest triumvir in the relationship between uh, Octavian in the west and Antony in the east. And uh, these blue territories here um, are actually, uh, they were controlled by Sextus Pompey, uh, the son of uh, Gnaeus uh, Pompey, who was uh, killed by Ptolemy the 13th. He was eventually going to be defeated as well. And Sextus will be uh, defeated and killed uh, by uh, Octavian and Lepidus, Lepidus's forces primarily by the year uh, 35 BCE. Former allies, Antony and Octavian, former um, friends and supporters of, of Julius Caesar, you might say clients of Julius Caesar, um, eventually become enemies. Um, one of the reasons for this was because Mark Antony was spending a lot more time in eastern, um, the eastern sections of the Roman uh, Republic, especially Greece and Egypt with Cleopatra. Um, Cleopatra was the ruler of Egypt, but she was of Greek ancestry. And Antony was plotting to have Caesarion, the uh, supposed son of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, made the next dictator of Rome. Basically, he wanted to create a kingdom. Um, where Caesar's alleged supposed son would be the next king or dictator, and Antony would be kind of the shadow leader behind um, uh, the control of the government. Naturally, Octavian opposed this and um, because he wanted to rule Rome himself. Um, Octavian published Antony's plans, particularly his, his relationship with Cleopatra, and that turned a lot of Romans in the western part of the Republic against Antony. They thought he was plotting a foreign takeover of their republic. And they also didn't want to be uh, ruled by a child that was half half foreign and not uh, legitimate um, because Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were not married. And so An Antony is then um, forced to fight against uh, Octavian. They fight a series of battles, uh, mostly in and around Greece. Uh, the Battle of Actium um, was the decisive battle that basically brought an end to Antony's uh, power. It was fought about September 2nd, 31 BCE. Um, Octavian had trapped Antony's legions um, in a small port town on the west coast of Greece, and then he surrounded the port with his ships. Um, basically, they were blockaded on both land and sea, a lot like what happened um, to Carthage. Uh, Octavian's ships were smaller, and he had a lot more ships uh, than Antony, about 400 versus 250. The sea was very rough that day, and the big ships of Antony just could not maneuver in the, the rough seas. So Octavian's uh, forces were able to defeat um, Antony's ships. And the morale of, of Octavian, or not Octavian, of Antony's um, sailors and marines really dropped when they saw Cleopatra fleeing the battle. Um, so in the end, uh, Actium, um, Antony's military power is destroyed and he's forced to flee to Egypt, um, only to be pursued by uh, Octavian. This is where uh, the Battle of Actium was fought. This is on the uh, western coast of, of Greece. The uh, wind was probably also um, more advantageous for Octavian than it was for Antony. 
you know, these are the days of sailing ships. Sails would often be taken down um, uh, for combat when rowers would be used, but it would have allowed um, uh, Octavian's uh, ships to get into position much more easily before they took their sails down for battle. And this is a, a prow or ram of a uh, ship from the battle. It's not clear which, which faction, which side it belonged to. This is a uh, relief uh, commemorating Octavian's victory at Actium. You know, I remember it shows the, uh, the aft castle, it shows Marines fighting, and of course it features uh, rowers. This is the foundation of the Actium Victory Monument that um, Octavian had built for himself to commemorate his defeat of Antony. All that's left is uh, the foundation, as you can see. After the defeat at Actium, Antony and Cleopatra flee to Egypt, and Octavian's forces follow them and defeat what's left of their troops. Cleopatra uh, flees into uh, what was believed to be her tomb uh, and then prepares to commit suicide. Antony believes that Cleopatra has committed suicide and stabs himself, uh, preparing to die, only to find that Cleopatra is still alive and the stories say that he then died in her, her arms uh, in a very romantic way. In order to avoid uh, being captured by Octavian, Cleopatra also is said to have committed suicide along with some of her attendants. Um, there's many different accounts about how she killed herself. Some say that she used a uh, viper, an asp snake, uh, its venom. She allowed the snake to bite her and then she died. Others say that she may have injected herself with a poison um, there were needles and things like that in, in this point in history, and we know that people in uh, Greco-Roman times knew how to use poisons. We don't know for sure because we have not found the bodies of Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, the tomb location is unknown, um, where they were actually buried, their final resting place is unknown, but archaeologists debate its location, and there's many sites that they're investigating, which we'll talk about in a moment. Experts believe that the tomb of Cleopatra and Antony um, was probably in uh, Taposiris Magna, outside of Alexandria. Um, this is, by the way, a necropolis or city of the dead in Greek. There's many individuals buried in this site. Most of their remains are mummified in the uh, Egyptian custom that was adopted by the Greeks that moved to um, Egypt. This is a uh, bust of Cleopatra found near the site, and this is a bust of Mark Antony um, as well. Remember, the, um, the Greeks that took control of Egypt often portrayed themselves in the Egyptian style to get the support of the Egyptian people. So now we'll look at the tomb and some of the uh, human remains at uh, the tomb. First, we'll look at the tomb itself. Um, it's a series of shafts and graves underground. Um, there are burials that date from the time of the death of Cleopatra in about 30 BCE. Uh, there's mummified remains of multiple individuals at the site. The remains have been heavily damaged by flooding. This site is on the coast. Coastlines change with time. Um, inscriptions of Antony and Cleopatra have been found nearby. So some people think that they were probably buried in this necropolis, although identifying their remains from the others would be very difficult. But this site is still important because it shows that the Greeks um, were interested in practicing mummification in Egyptian uh, burial rite. Um, the Greeks really didn't like um, the preservation of bodies in their own civilization. They thought that that was uh, not an appropriate thing to do. But when they took over Egypt, they began to adopt this Egyptian tradition of preservation of the dead. And actually, later Romans will also um, practice mummification as well once they have control of Egypt. So now we'll, we'll look at some of uh, the mummies that are, are left behind. Here are uh, some of the mummified remains and other interesting remains found at Taposiris Magna. You can see that the mummified remains are not, not in very good shape. They, there's been water damage. Um, it's really mostly just skeletal remains at this point, as you can see. What's interesting is some of the remains in the site have golden tongues. It's believed that these golden uh, prosthetic tongues were placed inside the deceased after they had died post-mortem 
so that they could um, talk with the dead. Here we see the um, death mask from an anthropoid. Anthropoid means human-shaped coffin. This is made in more of the Greek style rather than the Egyptian style. It's um, the style is a little bit different than those used by the Egyptians earlier on. And here we see multiple mummified um, individuals uh, placed together. It's possible these are a family. Um, it's also possible that multiple generations were buried in these tombs, and sometimes even uh, slaves and servants would be buried with the family, post-mortem, of course. Uh, here again is the extent of the uh, Roman Empire at its greatest point. Egypt was added um, to the Roman Empire after the death of Cleopatra between like 30 and 27 BCE. We also see Gaul here brought in by Julius Caesar, Greece, Anatolia brought in in stages, and of course North Africa and Hispania, and then Britannia is going to be brought in uh, under Emperor Claudius, which we'll talk about in a future video. So in 30 BCE, Octavian is elected consul with his general, Marcus Agrippa. Uh, three years later, by 27 BCE, um, the Senate declares Octavian Augustus Princeps, meaning the illustrious one or the first citizen. The Romans will refer to their emperor as the first citizen. Even though Augustus was an autocrat, a king in all but name, he knew he couldn't claim to be a king. He couldn't wear a crown. He couldn't refer to himself as a monarch. The Romans, especially Romans of the upper class, would not have tolerated that. So he refers to himself as the first citizen. And instead of dressing himself as a king, he dresses as a general. Um, we see that he's wearing a toga, a symbol of Roman culture, uh, but he's also wearing a uh, Roman style uh, breastplate. And the upper class came to support um, Octavian as emperor, or Augustus Caesar, as he came to be called, um, because he promised stability for um, Rome. And he also promised that he would not be a king. And even though he would have, legally speaking, all of the power, he would not just trample over the Senate. And he would do good things for the Roman people. So everyday people liked Augustus Caesar because he was related to Julius Caesar. He was a successful general. And the elite eventually came to support Augustus Caesar because he promised them stability and he promised that he would not um, be a, a, a tyrant. He promised he would be the first citizen. He would be the chief patron of the Roman people and everyone would be his client, but he would be a good patron. And so with the uh, ascension of Octavian to Augustus Caesar, his becoming emperor, the Roman Republic comes to an end. And this is a, uh, a life-size marble statue of Augustus Caesar that's actually in the Vatican and a coin uh, bearing the profile of Augustus Caesar. Here is the division of the Roman Empire about the year 14 CE. So uh, during Augustus Caesar's reign, um, the red regions are ruled by the emperor via lifetime uh, delegates called uh, Pro Praetorian legates. These would be appointed by uh, the emperor to rule uh, for life in these uh, these uh, provinces shown here in red. Uh, blue regions are going to be ruled by the Senate via annual proconsuls or governors that they uh, appointed. So the Senate does have some control over some of the Roman provinces in uh, the imperial system. The emperor, though, has the most power by far. And Italia, shown in yellow, is going to be ruled directly by the Senate. But the Senate uh, in this system must defer to the emperor if uh, the emperor and the Senate have a disagreement. Final thing we'll talk about in this video is um, this, this statue of Augustus Caesar and its painted replicas. The Romans generally painted their statues in a variety of colors. Um, here we see Augustus Caesar painted. Um, it's said that he had fairly fairly light skin and that he had reddish blonde hair, as, as these statues show. Um, he wears purple, purplish red, the color of the, of the Julius Caesar, a color of royalty, but also just a color of wealth. Remember, Caesar didn't want to, Augustus Caesar did not want to seem too much like a, uh, a king. 
So he portrays himself in armor and a toga rather than like a crown. The armor, of course, highlights his military successes. His breastplate um, features a series of reliefs um, showing stories from Roman history and stories of the gods um, to show that he um, has not just ruled because of his military power, but because of divine power. Interestingly enough, there's also sphinxes, symbols of Egypt, on his uh, breastplate as well. Those are supposed to symbolize his defeat of Cleopatra and his takeover of Egypt. Conclusion. Roman militarism strengthened and enlarged the Roman Republic as seen during events like the Punic Wars and the capture of Greece, Anatolia, Syria, Gaul, etc. The Marian reforms uh, instituted by Consul Marius were meant to strengthen the Roman military and professionalize soldiering in the Roman Republic, but it also made uh, Roman legionaries more loyal to their generals than to the Senate and the Republic. Um, other issues like uh, breakdown of systems of patron-client obligations also are going to be a problem in uh, the late Roman Republic. So uh, increased militarism, the Marian reforms uh, making soldiers more loyal to their generals and their legions than to Rome itself, combined with uh, breakdowns in uh, um, obligation systems um, as seen by the failure of the Gracchi reforms, for example, uh, the Catiline conspiracy. Uh, Romans were increasingly turning to violence to solve their problems and to take and consolidate power rather than using peaceful civil means. And this turn to violence uh, will uh, threaten the stability of the Republic. It will lead to civil wars, the dictatorship of Sulla and then uh, Julius Caesar, and ultimately the rise of Emperor Caesar Augustus, who will uh, dissolve the Republic and become emperor. And as emperor, he will claim to be uh, a patron of the Roman people, the, uh, the first citizen. But really, um, he and other emperors are kings in all but name. Uh, the Roman government and the Senate have to defer to him. And of course, the people must obey the emperor. And we'll talk about uh, the Roman Empire in coming videos.